to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he does meditate both day and night. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Welcome to our study of the joy of salvation. There is no greater joy and no better feeling based on fact than to know that one has obeyed the gospel and that he is right with God. Being a Christian and living the Christian life is the greatest joy a person could ever imagine. And today we want to think about what makes salvation such a joy. What makes it a joy to be a Christian? Let's begin with the beautiful words of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. Very simply, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always and again I will say rejoice. No matter what situation I find myself in, I can always have joy. Now, I know that such is the case, and I know Paul lived what he preached. For in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, Paul and Silas are in prison in Philippi, and the Bible says they're praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners are listening to them. They are rejoicing even in a deep, dark, dank dungeon in Philippi. They still were being shining lights for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus, even for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And so we can have joy in any situation if we'll only decide to and if we truly understand what our joy is based in. What makes the Christian life and being a Christian so much joy? There is redemption in Christ. I can rejoice today knowing that I've been redeemed. Christians often sing the song, I've been redeemed. How true that is. We have been bought back to God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Notice Romans 3 and verse 24. The Bible says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, by the grace of God, that grace that brings salvation that's appeared to all men, Titus 2, verses 11 through 13, that grace combined with faith that saves us, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, that grace is what gives us the redemption in Christ Jesus. God sent His own Son, to be a ransom, to buy us back to God. He gave His own life so that the price could be paid and we could be restored in that relationship with God. You, you see that scene in Revelation chapter 5, and there's the Lamb standing, as it were, from the foundation of the world with its throat slit, and blood is draining out. That blood is the blood that cleanses us from sin, and that's the price that Jesus paid. You see, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, and there is one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus himself. God wants us to be redeemed so bad that he sent his son to be both the sacrifice and the mediator in that redemption. John thought about the idea of Jesus' sacrifice in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, and he said, He was the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. Jesus tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2, verses 9 through 10. And because he was willing to make that ultimate sacrifice, this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God because his sacrifice appeased the wrath of God. Jesus' price is what buys us back to God. We are ransomed 
bought back by the blood of Christ. Galatians chapter 1, verse 14. Titus 2, verse 14 teaches us that it is Jesus' sacrifice that makes that possible. And oh, how I love the beautiful words of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He himself bore in his own body our sins upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might, la might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. It's as Isaiah said in the long ago, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes. We are healed. What a wonderful act of love and mercy Jesus gave in making that sacrifice so that we could go to heaven. What makes Christianity a joy? I can be redeemed in Christ. Secondly, Christianity is a joy because there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. I can be sure if I'm living faithful, I've got that home in heaven that God has promised. Think about the beautiful words of Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Notice what the scripture says. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There's no condemnation, meaning that if I live faithful, I'm not going to have to hear the gavel come down and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I will be right with God, and I will have that home in heaven. Now, as we think about condemnation, let's realize there is condemnation to the unbelieving. Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. If one does not believe in Jesus and obey the gospel, there is the fear of condemnation. Paul wrote about this to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9, and he spoke of God coming in a flaming fire to take vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel, they'll be destroyed from the presence of God. And how can we overlook that scene in Luke chapter 16? The rich man who had it all in this life was utterly cast into torment and writhed in the pain of the fires there. Revelation 21.8 describes it as a place for the cowardly, the abominable, the murderers, the liars. It is a place of eternal torment. The smoke and brimstone of their fire goes up forever and ever. But the good news is Christ has overcome sin and we can do the same through him. Revelation 3.21, to him that overcomes, Jesus said, I'll give the tree the right to the tree of life. You can come over in essence and live with me, Jesus says. God is not going to condemn us on the day of judgment if we remain faithful to him. 1 John 2 verse 25 says, this is the promise he has promised us. You can take it to the bank. We have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Titus 1 verse 2 says, we're living in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. And so, yes, if I remain faithful, if I seek first the kingdom, if I repent of sin as it comes into my life, if I live for Jesus every day, then I can be sure there's not going to be condemnation on the day of judgment. There'll be that pronouncement. Enter in, good and faithful servant, into the joys of your Lord. As you think about the joy of Christianity, we can also rejoice because we have that great victory in Christ Jesus. Think of the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. Paul says, Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. We have the, the great victory if we're faithful to Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Well, what victory? For there to be a victory, there must be something to be victorious over. You see, right now, we're in a battle. That battle has been waging since Genesis chapter 3 when the sly serpent tempted Adam and Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit and because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. 2 Corinthians 10 tells us that that battle is not a physical battle. 
Will we walk in the flesh? We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our, our battle are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We're fighting a spiritual battle against the host of wickedness, Ephesians 6 verse 12, and we must contend earnestly for the faith. Now, not only are we in a battle, we've got to prepare for this battle. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 17 says we've got to take up the whole armor of God so that we can do battle. No one going into battle is going to be absent of training. You've got to make sure that you have proper training, that you've got the proper equipment, that your body, that your mind, that in every way you're prepared for the battle. Christians must do the same thing. But the good news again is if we do these things, we will be victorious. Paul could say at the end of his life in 2 Timothy 4 verses 6 through 8, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, but not for me only, but for all those who loved his appearing. How could Paul say he knew that? Because he had been fighting the battle. He had been making sure that he was doing the will of God and he never gave up on Christ or Christianity. Another reason that Christianity is a great joy is because in Christ we get a second chance. Aren't there times in your life that you can think of where you'd have liked to have a do-over, where you would have liked to have just a second chance and to, and to go back and correct those mistakes and start fresh? That's what we get in Christ Jesus. Listen to the words of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. The scripture says, Therefore, if any was in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Christ, we get that second chance. If anyone is in Christ, he is that new creation. You see, before we obeyed the gospel, we were dead. Paul said in Ephesians 2 verse 12, You who were dead in your trespasses and sins, he's made alive. Romans 3.23 tells us that all, not some, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3 verse 10. And as a result, the scripture clearly teaches the wages of sin is death. But here's the good news. Romans 6.17 says, Thanks be to God, not only for his gift, but if we obey from the heart that form of doctrine, we've been set free from sin. Now, as new creatures... You have to live a new life. That is, you've got to have a new focus in life. Romans 6 verses 1 through 4 explains the process of conversion. We die to sin, we're buried with Christ in baptism, and we rise out of the water to walk in newness of life. I've got to change the focus I've got in this life. I'm no longer living for self. I'm dying to self to live for Jesus. Galatians 2.20 I'm no longer fulfilling my lust and my passions. I'm trying to help others and do good unto all men. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. That means that we must, if we're going to take advantage of this second chance, we must be faithful to Jesus in every way. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, Be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. We must labor in the vineyard of the Lord and realize that it's that labor, that work, that really accounts toward our heavenly goal. And then we must, with this new chance, we must be a powerful example for Jesus Christ. Do you remember the words? of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Paul told Timothy, be an example to the believers in word and conduct and spirit and faith and purity in everything. We now need to let the light of Jesus shine in us. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so let's think for just a moment, not only about the second chance but I believe Christianity and the Christian life is a great joy because in Christ I have access to every spiritual blessing. Notice the words of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. The scripture says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I now have, as a child of God, every spiritual blessing. Any blessing you can imagine from God, I've got access to. Well, let's think about some of those for just a moment. As a blessing, I now have the privilege to be God's child. 1 John 3 verse 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we can be called children of God. We can look up to heaven and say, Our Father who art in heaven, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. And along with being a child of God, I've got access to God's inheritance. Galatians 4 verse 4 says, In the fullness of time God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, He sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We now have access to all that God has given us, all that belongs to God. We have that heavenly inheritance. One of the greatest blessings we could ever imagine is the inheritance in heaven. Paul said in Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21, For our true citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body into his glorious body. My citizenship is not here on this earth. My citizenship is not really in the United States of America. My citizenship is in heaven. That's where I want to go. I want to go to that new heaven and that new earth where righteousness prevails, Revelation chapter 21. And then we also have the beautiful blessing of prayer. Oh, how could we make it without prayer? James 5 verse 16, the scripture says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. Prayer has powerful results in the life of a Christian. I'm reminded of 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. Christians are to pray without ceasing. Jesus taught us in Luke chapter 18 verse 1 to not get discouraged, but to pray. Let not your heart be troubled, but we're to pray to God and ask for His help. And oh, how I love the example of Jesus. Mark chapter 1 verse 35. The Bible says, In the morning, a great while before daylight, He departed went to a solitary place, and there prayed. Jesus realized the importance of prayer. In the garden, Jesus prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He gained strength, and no doubt he was encouraged to do the will of God. And thus we must come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. But then another great blessing that we have, and this is often overlooked, is we have the blessing of fellowship inside the family of God. Not only am I in a relationship with God and His Son, but I am in a relationship with other Christians. We have brothers and sisters in Christ inside the body who will help and encourage us when we get down and when we get discouraged. The Bible tells us to encourage one another daily. Hebrews 3 verses 12 and 13. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24. Just like in that first century church in Acts chapter 4 verse 32, they gathered together, they have one mind, one heart, and they were a force to be reckoned with in spreading the gospel. And one of the reasons is they had great men and women like Barnabas, the son of encouragement. How we need to realize the power of fellowship and encouragement inside the body of Christ. But then there's another blessing, and this is sure a blessing that we don't want to overlook. In Christ, I have the forgiveness of all my past sins. I believe one of the most beautiful passages in Scripture about forgiveness is Psalm 103, verse 10. I want you to notice this, Psalm 103, verse 10. The Scripture simply says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Have you ever stopped and thought about the, the power and what that verse is really saying? God's not dealt with us according to our sins. What's that mean? I didn't get 
what I deserve for my sin. If I got what I deserve, I'd go straight to hell. He's not punished us according to our iniquities. There you see the forgiveness of God. The next two verses say, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Oh, what a joy and a blessing it is to know that I don't have to carry the burden of my sin. The psalmist, as he thought about sin, said in Psalm 38 verse 4, My sins have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. Sin is that weight. It is that drowning effect that we often feel, and yet the burden is lifted at Calvary. I can be forgiven of all past sins. Think of a few passages in the New Testament that reveal the beauty of forgiveness. Matthew 26, verse 28. As Jesus is there with his disciples, instituting the Lord's Supper, he now institutes the fruit of the vine as the remembrance of his blood. And as he does that, Jesus says, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. What a wonderful thought to know that Jesus' blood gives us that forgiveness. And then Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. God will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. I believe that's amazing with some of the recent findings that we have. In some places, the sea is over 30,000 feet deep. When God says, I'll cast all your sins into the depths of the sea, God's saying your sins will be so far away, they won't hurt you anymore. Hebrews 8 verse 12, God says, I'll be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. Isn't it wonderful to know that God is not going to hold our sins against us? That we're not going to have to stand before God and give an account of all the ungodly things that we've done in this life? that we truly have been forgiven in Christ Jesus. Well, as we think about being in Christ, let's also think today about how does a person get into Jesus Christ. If salvation's in Christ, if redemption's there, if I find the victory there, if forgiveness is there, the next logical question is, how do I get into Christ? How do I obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, the scriptures make it abundantly clear what you've got to do to get into Christ. For example, imagine a circle. And this circle represents being in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 teaches, Inside this circle are all spiritual blessings. The Bible teaches in 2 Timothy 1 verse 10 that also in this circle is salvation in Christ. But now, imagine you're outside that circle. How does the person outside of Christ, outside of all spiritual blessings, and outside of salvation get into Christ where that is? The Bible teaches us as many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. That person who is outside is put inside the kingdom of God, inside the circle of salvation by the waters of baptism. Now, think about another example that goes in accord with this. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 teaches us that we're buried with Christ in baptism and we're baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's say you've got a dead person out here, someone spiritually dead. How are they going to access the life-saving blood and salvation of Jesus? They're buried with Christ in baptism and both Galatians 3.27 and Romans 6, 1 through 4 go hand in hand to teach that it is baptism that puts one inside the body of Christ. So think about all the examples in the New Testament that you see from Acts chapter 2 to the end of the book. There are a host of examples of people obeying the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For example, in Acts chapter 2, on that great day of Pentecost, when they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer was clear. Peter didn't say, Don't do anything. Jesus has done it all. Peter said, You need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You come on down to Acts chapter 8, and here you've got Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. 
They, he, he, the Spirit tells him, go over and overtake the chariot. He runs over there. Uh, understand what you're reading? How can I unless someone teach me? And from that point, Isaiah 53, he begins to teach him about Jesus. Now, he gets the point. For they come to a certain water, and he says, hey, here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? And in Acts chapter 8, verse 34 following, he tells him, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He makes that great confession. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And they both get down out of the chariot. They go down into the water, and he baptizes him. Acts chapter 9, the conversion of Saul. Acts chapter 10, the conversion of Cornelius and his house. Think about Saul's conversion. You get to the rest of the story in Acts chapter 22. You remember the account? Saul is still breathing murders and threats against the church. He's headed with letters to drag men and women to prison in Acts chapter 9. But along the road, he is presented with that great light. It shines forth, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? He recognizes who Jesus is. He makes that good confession. He believes in Christ. But did he obey the gospel in baptism? We turn over to Acts 22. Paul now recounts his own conversion. He's told to go in the city and to be told you what you must do. Ananias comes to him and says, Saul, Saul, why tarriest thou? Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, do you have the joy to be found in Christ? Maybe you've never obeyed God's plan of salvation. Maybe you've never submitted to the words of this book. We urge you today to become a Christian. If you're willing to hear the word, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. If you're willing to believe Jesus is God's Son, John 3, verse 16. If you're willing to repent of things that are wrong in your life, Luke chapter 13, verse 3. If you'll make that good confession, Romans 10, verse 10. And if you'll be baptized in water, you can have the hope and the joy of salvation. Jesus made it so plain that you need help to misunderstand it. Jesus said... He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Have you been baptized to be saved? Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you sure that you're in Christ? We urge you today to think seriously about your own salvation. We want you to know that we love you and that God loves you. And more than anything, we want you to go to heaven. We want you to be a child of God and we want you to experience the joy of Christ which surpasses all understanding. May God help us to live every day with the joy of Christianity. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.